handbook for mankind. Lesson 1 Looking at Buddhism by Puttatha Pico If we opened any recent book on the origins of religion, we find that there is one point on which all others are in agreement. They all agree in saying that religion arose in the world of the fear. Primitive forest dwelling man fear thunder and lightning, darkness and storms, and various things about him that he was unable to understand or control. His method of avoiding the danger he saw in this phenomena was to demonstrate either humility and submissions or homage and relevance depending on which he felt was most appreciate. Later, as man's knowledge and understanding developed, this fear of the forces of nature changed into a fear of phenomena more difficult to apprehend. Religions based on difference to objects of fear, such as natural phenomena, spirits, and celestial beings came to be looked down upon as unreasonable and ridiculous. And then man's fear became still more refined into a fear of suffering. Suffering of the sort that cannot be out evaded by any material means. He came to fear the suffering inherent in birth, aging, pain, and death. The disappointment and hopelessness which arise out of desire, anger, and stupidity, which no amount of power or wealth can relieve. Long ago in India, a country well provide with thinkers and investigators. Intelligent people dispensed with all pain of homage and supernatural beings and started seeking instead of means of conquering birth aging, pain, and death. The means of eliminating greed, hatred, and delusion. Out of this search arose Buddhism, a higher religion based on insight 
a means of conquering birth, aging, pain, and death. A method for destroying the mental defilements. Buddhism has its origins in fear of this last kind. Just as do all religions based in intelligence. The Buddha discovered how to inquire absolutely what man fears. He discovered a practical method now called Buddhism for eliminating suffering. Buddhism means the teaching of the enlightened one. A Buddha is an enlightened individual, one who knows the truth about all things, one who knows just what is what, and so is capable of behaving appropriately with respect to all things. Buddhism is a religion based on intelligence, science, and knowledge, whose purpose is the destruction of suffering and the source of suffering. All paying of homage to sacred objects by means of performing rites and rituals. Making offerings of praying is not Buddhism. The Buddha rejected all of these as foolish, ridiculous, and unsound. He also rejected the celestial beings, then considered by certain groups to be the creators of things and the deities supposed to dwell one in each star in the sky. Thus, we find that the Buddha made such statements as these. Knowledge, skill, and ability are conducive to success and benefit and are auspicious omens, good in their own right regardless of the movement of the heavenly bodies. With the benefits gained from these qualities, one will completely outstrip those foolish people who just sit making their astrological calculations. And if the water in the rivers, such as the Ganges, could really wash away the sins and suffering. Then the turtles, crabs, fish, and shellfish living in those sacred 
rivers ought by now to be freed of their sins and sufferings too. And if a man could eliminate suffering by making offerings, paying homage, and praying, there would be no one subject to suffering left in the world because anyone at all can pay homage and pray. But since people are still subject to suffering, while in the very act of making obeisances, paying homage and performing rites, it is clearly not the way to gain liberation. To attain liberation, we first have to examine things closely in order to come to know and understand their true nature. Then we have to behave in a way appropriate to that true nature. This is the Buddhist teaching. This we must know and bear in mind. Buddhism has nothing to do with prostrating oneself and differing to awesome things. It set no store by rites and ceremonies such as making liberation of holy water or any externals whatsoever, spirits and celestial beings included. On the contrary, it depends on reason and insight. Buddhism does not demand conjecture or supposition. It demands that we act in accordance with what our own insight reveals and not take anyone else's word for anything. If someone comes and tells us something, we must not believe him without question. We must listen to his statement and examine it. Then, if we find it reasonable, we may accept it provisionally and set about trying to verify it for ourselves. This is a key feather of Buddhism, which distinguishes it sharply from other world religions. Now, a religion is a many side thing. Seen from one angel, it has a certain appearance. Seen from another angel, it has another. Many people look at religion from the wrong angle. And Buddhism is no exception. Different individuals looking at Buddhism with different mental attitudes are bound to get different views of it. 
because each of us naturally has confidence in his own opinions. The truth for each of us coincides with our own particular understanding and point of view. Consequently, the truth is not quite the same thing for different people. They all penetrate questions to varying depths by varying methods and with varying degrees of intelligence. A person does not recognize as true. According to his own ideas of the truth, anything that lies beyond this, his own intelligence, knowledge, and understanding, and even through his may outwardly go along with other people's ideas as to what is the truth. He knows in himself that it is not the truth as he himself see it. Each person's conception of the truth may change and develop with the lay the day by day increase in his degree of intelligence, knowledge, and understanding until such time as he arrives at the ultimate truth. And each of us has different ways of examining and testing before believing. So if Buddhism is viewed with differing degrees of intelligence, differing pictures of it will be seen simply because it can be viewed from any aspect. As we have said, Buddhism is a practical method for liberating oneself from suffering by means of coming to realize as did the Buddha himself. The true nature of things. Now, any religious text is bound to contain material which later people have found occasion to add to. And our Tipitaka is no exception. People in later ages have added sections based on then current ideas either in order to boost people's confidence or out of excessive religious zeal. Regrettably, even the rites and rituals which have developed and become mixed in with the religion are now accepted and recognized as Buddhism proper. Ceremonies such as setting up trays of sweets and fruit as offerings to the soul of the Buddha in the same way as arms. Food is offering a monk just do not fit in with Buddhist principles. Yet, some groups consider these to be 
genuine Buddhist practice. Teaching it as such and keeping to it very strictly. Rites and ceremonies of this kind have become so numerous that they now completely obscure the real Buddhism and it, its original purpose. Take for example the procedure of becoming ordained a monk. There has come into existence, existence the ceremony of making gifts to the newly ordained bhikkhu. Gates are invited to bring food and to watch proceedings. And as a result, there is much drunkenness and noise. Ceremonies are performed both at the temple and in the home. The new Piku later leaves the order again only a few days after having been ordained and may become an even stronger temple, temple hater than he was before. It must be borne in mind that there was none of this at the time of the Buddha. It is a later development. Ordination at the time of the Buddha meant simply that some individual who had obtained his parents' consent renounced home and family. He was a person who was able to close accounts at home and go off to join the Buddha and the order of Pikuts. On some convenient occasion, he would go to be ordained and perhaps not see his parents or his family again for the rest of his life. Though some Pikuts might go back to visit their parents again on suitable occasions. This was rare. There that exists a rule permitting a Piku to go home when there is a good reason for doing so. But at the time of the Buddha, this was not the done thing. Pikus did not receive the ordination with their parents in attendance, nor did they celebrate the event as a great occasion, only to leave the Sangha again after just a few days no better off than at first, as commonly happens in the present day. All these presenting of gifts to newly ordained bhikkhus, this performing of ceremonies, including all sorts of celebration. These we are foolish enough to call Buddhism. Furthermore, we choose to make much of it, thinking nothing of spending all our money or other people's on account of it. 
This Neo Buddhism is so widespread as to be almost universal. The Dharma, the genuine teaching that once was paramount, has become so overlaid by ceremonial that the whole objective of Buddhism has been obscured, falsified and changed. Ordination, for instance, has become a face-saving gambit for young men who people have been pointing at for never having been ordained or a prerequisite to finding a wife as having been a monk is considered a sign of maturity or is done with some other kind of ulterior motive. In some places, an ordination is regarded as an opportunity for collecting money, for which job there are always people on hand to help. It is one way of getting rich. Even this they call Buddhism. And anyone who goes and criticizes this is considered to be ignorant of Buddhism or opposed to it. Another example is the presentation of Katina cloth. The Buddha's original intention was to have cloth for robes given to all the pickles. Simultaneously so that they could sew it together themselves with a minimum loss of time. If there was only one robe, it was allocated to some pikku, not necessarily the most senior one, whom the group considered worthy for using that robe or in need of it, and was presented to him in the name of the entire order. The Buddha's intention was to avoid any pickles having a high opinion of himself. On that day, everyone, regardless of rank, had to humble himself and be one of the cloud. Everyone had to lend a hand cutting and sewing the cloth, boiling three pits to make the dye, and whatever else was involved in getting the ropes ready and finished the same day. Making the cloth into ropes was a cooperative effort. That is how the Buddha intended it to be. And even not necessarily involving lay people at all. But nowadays it has become an affair involving ceremony, fun and games, loud laughter, and money seeking. It is just a picnic and is devoid of all the desirable results 
originally intended. This sort of thing is a tumor which has developed in Buddhism and thrived. The tumor takes hundreds of different forms too numerous to name. It is a dangerous, malignant growth which can degrees has completely overlaid and obscure the good material, the real pit of Buddhism, and quite disfigured it. One result of this has been the arising of many sects, some large, some insignificant, as of shoots from the original religion. Some sects have even become involved in sensuality. It is essential that we always discriminate in order to recognize what is the real, original Buddhism. We must not foolishly grasp at the outer shell or become so attached to the various rituals and ceremonies that the real object becomes quite lost to view. The real practice of Buddhism is based on purification of conduct by way of body and speech, followed by purification of the mind, which in its turn leads to insight and right understanding. Don't go thinking that such and such is Buddhism just because everyone says it is. The tumor has been spreading constantly since the day the Buddha died, expanding in all directions right up to the present day so that it is now quite soluble. The tumor in Buddhism must not be misidentified as Buddhism itself. It is also wrong for people of other religions to come and point at this shameful and disgraceful growths as being Buddhism. It is unjust because these things are not Buddhism at all. They are excrescences. Those of us interested in furthering Buddhism whether as a foothold for all people or for our own private well-being, must know how to get hold of the true essence of Buddhism and not just grab at some worthless outgrowth. Now, even the genuine Buddhism is many side, a fact which may lead to a false grasp of true meaning. For instance, if looked at from the front of view of a moral philosopher, Buddhism is seen to be a religion of morality that is talk of merit and demerit. 
good and evil, honesty, gratitude, harmony, open heartedness, and much more besides. The Tipitaka is full of moral teachings. Many newcomers to Buddhism approach it from this angle and are attracted to it on this account. A more profound aspect is Buddhism as truth, as the deep hidden truth laying below the surface and invisible to the ordinary man. To see this truth is to know intellectual emptiness of all things. The transcess unsatisfactoriness and non-selfhood of all things. To know intellectually the nature of suffering, of the complete elimination of suffering and of the way to attain the complete elimination of suffering. To perceive these in terms of absolute truth, the kind that changes and which everyone ought to know. This is Buddhism as truth. Buddhism as religion is Buddhism as a system of practice based on morality, concentration and insight and culminating in liberating insight, a system which then practiced to completion enables one to break free from suffering. This is Buddhism as religion. Then there is Buddhism as psychology. As it is presented to us in the third section of the Tipitaka, where the nature of the mind is described in remarkable detail. Buddhist psychology is a source of interest and astonishment to students of the mind, even in the present day. It is far more detailed and profound than present day psychological knowledge. Another aspect of is Buddhism as philosophy. Philosophical knowledge can be clearly seen by means of reasoned, logical proofs that cannot be demonstrated experimentally. It contrasts with science, which is knowledge resulting from seeing something clearly with our eyes or through physical experimentation and proof or even with the inner eye of intuition. 
profound knowledge, such as that of emptiness, a just philosophy for a person who has not yet penetrated to the truth, and science for another who has done so, such as a fully enlightened individual or arahant who has seen it clearly, intuitively. Many aspects of Buddhism, in particular the Four Noble Truths, are scientific insofar as they can be verified by clear experimental proof using introspection. For anyone equipped with awareness and interested in studying and carrying out research, the court effect. Relationships are there just as in science. Buddhism is not just something obscure and vogue, not just philosophy as are man-made objects. Some look on Buddhism as culture. Anyone with a high regard for a culture finds many aspects of Buddhist practice, which are common to all cultures and also many that are characteristical. Buddhist and far better and higher than anything in other cultures. Of all these various aspects, the one a real Buddhist ought to take most interest in is Buddhism as religion. We ought to look on Buddhism as a direct practical method for gaining knowledge of the true nature of things. Knowledge which makes it possible to give up every form of grasping and clinging of stupidity and infatuation and become completely independent of things. To do this is to penetrate to the essence of Buddhism. Buddhism considered in this aspect is far more useful than Buddhism considered as mere morality or as truth, which is simply profound knowledge and not really practical. And more useful than Buddhism, considered as philosophy, as something to be enjoyed as an object of speculation and argument of no value in the giving up of the mental defilements and certainly more useful than Buddhism considered simply as culture, as attractive behavior, noteworthy from the sociological viewpoint. At the very least, everyone ought to consider Buddhism as art, as the art of living. In, order, in other words, as skill and 
competent in being a human being. Living in a way that is exemplary and praiseworthy, which so impresses others that they automatically wish to emulate it. What we have to do is to cultivate the three letters. Firstly, develop moral purity, training the mind to be tranquil and steady and fit to do its job. And finally, developing such an abundance of wisdom and clear insight into the nature of all things that those things are no longer able to give rise to suffering. When anyone's life has these three lusters, he can be considered to have mastered the art of living. Westerners are extremely interested in Buddhism as the art of living and discuss this aspect more than any other. Penetrating so far into the real essence of Buddhism that we are able to take it as our guide to living induces spiritual good cheer and joy. This person depression and disillusionment it also dispels fears such as the fear that the complete giving up of spiritual defilements would make life dry and dreary and utterly a void of flavor or the fear that complete freedom from craving would make all thought and action impossible. Whereas in reality, a person who organizes his life in accordance with the Buddhist art of living is fitter over all the things about him. Regardless of whether these things be animals, people, possessions, or anything else, and regardless of whether they enter that people's consciousness by way of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind, they will enter as Lusa, unable to be cloud, defy, or perturb him. The winning of the victory over all things is genuine bliss. Buddha Dharma will enrapture a mind that has developed a taste for it. It can be considered an indispensable form of nourishment too. True, a person still controlled by the defilements continues to desire nourishment by way of the eye, ear, nose,
tongue and body and goes in search for it as suits him his nature but there is another part of him something deeper that does not demand that sort of nourishment it is the free or pure element in his mind it which is the joy and delight of spiritual nourishment starting with the delight that results from no moral purity it is the source of contentment for fully enlightened individuals who possess such tranquility of mind that defilements cannot disturb them who posit clear insight into the true nature of all things and have no ambitions with regard to any of them they are so to speak able to sit down without being afflicted to run higher and yawn like those people to whom the buddha applied the semi smoke by night fire by day smoke by night refers to sleepfulness restlessness a sufferer from this complaint lies all night with hand on bro planning on going after this and that working out how to get money how to get rich quickly and get the various things he desires his mind is full of smoke all he can do is lie there until morning when he can get up and go running off the obedience to the witches of the smoke he has been holding back all night this fervent activity is what the Buddha referred to as fire by day these are the symptoms of a mind that has not achieved tranquility a mind that has been deprived of spiritual nourishment it is a pathological hunger and thirst induced by the defilement called craving all night long the victim represses the smoke and heat which in the morning becomes fire and then blazes hot inside him all day if a person is obliged throughout his entire life to suppress the smoke by night which then becomes fire by day how can he ever find peace and coolness just visualize his condition he enters suffering and torment all his life from birth up until he enters the coffin 
simply for lack of the insight that could completely extinguish that fire and smoke. To treat such a complaint, one has to make sure that the knowledge pre provided by the Buddha, the smoke and fire diminished in proportion to one's degree of understanding of the true nature of things. As we have said, Buddhism has a number of different aspects or sides. Just as the same mountain, when viewed from a different direction, presents a different appearance. So, different benefits are derived from Buddhism according to how one looks at it. Even Buddhism has its origins in fear, not the foolish fear of an ignorant person who kneels and makes obeisance to idols or strange phenomena, but a higher kind of fear, the fear of perhaps never attaining liberation from the oppression of birth, aging, pain, and death from the various forms of suffering we experience. The real Buddhism is not books, not manuals, not word for word repetition from the Tipitaka, nor is it rites and rituals. These are not the real Buddhism. The real Buddhism is the practice by way of body, speech, and mind that will destroy the defilements in part or completely. One need not have anything to do with books or manuals. One ought not to rely on rites and rituals or anything else external, including spirits and celestial beings. Rather, one must be directly concerned with bodily action, speech, and thought. That is, one must preserve in one's effort to control and eliminate the defilements so that clear insight can arise. One will then be automatically capable of acting appropriately and will be free from suffering from that moment right up to the end. This is the real Buddhism. This is what we have to understand let us not go foolishly grasping at the tumor that is obscuring Buddhism, taking it for the real thing.